This has always been the saddest verse for me in the entire scripture. But until the Holy Spirit started talking to me about it, I didn't understand why it always made me so sad. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. And every man, the Hebrew word there for man in that particular verse means every person. It is not the gender name. It is the mankind word. The word did is the word to act, to institute behavior. The word right is correct, pleasing, fitting, proper, but the next word puts it in perspective to his own mental and spiritual faculties. So what it's saying is everybody set up their own list of ethics. They did what was pleasing to them. But the first part of the verse is the key, there was no king. When there is no king in our life, it opens the door for us to do what is right in our own eyes. So the first thing of spiritual ethics is that we have to have such a strong, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ that what governs our life is, Jesus, I don't want to hurt you ever. I don't want to bring shame to you ever. And that helps us answer the ethical questions. But this same phrase appears one other place in the book of Judges, and it's in Judges 17. And I have always said that there is no subject that God doesn't address if you just let the Holy Spirit make application. And so this story gives us some key elements of what happens when people do what is right in their own eyes without a king over their spirit man. In verse 6, you find that verse. And in those days... There was no king in Israel, same problem. And every man did what was right in his own eyes. Now we're going to tear apart a man's life. And as we tear it apart, we're going to hit the major core of ministerial ethics. And please hear what the Brother Bill said this morning. This is the key issue in the body of Christ right now. We have lost our credibility because so many have lost their ethics. And what is frightening to me is that many ministers say to me, I've never heard ministerial ethics. I was, it was never taught in the Bible school I went to. It was never brought up with the person that mentored me. And so when that is not present, there isn't any guidelines to help you find your way in those gray areas. So let's go back and let's look at starting at verse 2. And he said to his mother, The 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you, about which you cursed, and also spoke about in my hearing, behold, I have the silver with me, I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be you by the Lord my son. And he restored the thousand shekels of silver to his mother. And she said, I had truly dedicated the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. So when he restored the money to his mother, she took 200 pieces of silver and gave them to the silversmith who made of it a graven image and a molten image. And they were in the house of Micah. I want you to look at what transpires because this man lives without a king. He takes the money from his mother and he hides it from her. Now she gets angry and she's cursing and she's saying, you know, you're judged. Whoever took my money is judged. And he finally admits, I took it. 
when we have a problem with ethics as far as financial accountability is concerned. We can take money for what seems to us a good cause to build something that we think is for a worship purpose. But if the motive and the spirit behind it is wrong, it becomes false worship. And we can never take money and misappropriate it from one fund to another fund. And this is a time in the body of Christ and pastors where we have to be so cautious that we don't get lax and say, well, it's okay. I know that it was dedicated money for X, but we have to do Y. And you begin to misappropriate the funds from one place to the other. Now, there's a way to do if you are in a tight spot and you need to do that. There is a way that the officials allow you to do that, and that's you have a board meeting and you make an official loan from that fund and you pay that back. But we cannot take money and misappropriate it. But what I want you to see is this man was so much a con man that when he said to his mother, I know you cursed the person that took the money. I want you to know it was me. He did it in such a way that she said, you're blessed. Now, I want you to hear me. Some people know how to get money out of people in a manipulative fashion. And because of it, the heart is wrong and therefore it is unethical the way the money is removed from people. And God is talking to us in this particular passage of scripture and he's saying when there is no king, you have a tendency to panic financially. Listen, we know this. It's not, I'm not giving you anything new. Jesus Christ is our source, not people. But sometimes in the ministry, we've got something that we look at and we say, we need this project really bad, and it's going to do X, Y, and Z for the kingdom of God. And we pray and pray and pray, and we don't get the money as quick as we think it needs to come in. So then we step in, like Brother Capuccio was talking about, and we help God. And when we do, we have stepped into something that is unethical, and we have opened the door for Satan to begin to attack us down the line. Because I want you to hear me, once you cross a line then it is so much easier to cross a bigger line and a bigger line and a bigger line. And the first time Satan takes you across the line, it's going to be such a small step across the line that you're going to look at it and say the end justifies the means. And here's the problem. That only happens when there's no king in the land. Because if we truly have that relationship with Jesus Christ where we say there is absolutely nothing impossible for you and you have everything in your hand, then we know the timing is absolutely perfect. Our church has just come through a situation where we desperately needed to do a memorial for a 12-year-old boy. He was shot and killed by his friend, it wiped our youth group out. It wiped out a lot of our adults. And I didn't understand. I couldn't, I kept saying, God, you've got to show me what is the key. And one day, one of our, I went back into the youth Sunday school room because they just were not recovering. And one of them finally looked at me and was just so angry and said, you're going to forget him. You never talk about him. His name is never mentioned. If we don't keep grieving for him, he's going to be forgotten and nobody's even going to know he lived. And I went home and I said, God, what am I going to do? And God gave me this idea of a memorial basketball court. 
And so we started raising money for this memorial basketball court. Now, I watched my kids, and I knew how intensively they were watching the church. And I knew they were judging the hearts of the adults by how long it took to raise that money. Now, I'm just being really open and honest with you. Satan said to me, you can do it this way. If you make a presentation this way, you will emotionally get the money. And it was one of those things where I knew I could do this or I could cross the line and get it done faster. And I battled it through and I stayed on this side of the line. And it took us a while to raise that money. Now, when we finished the court, I wrote a letter to the father. Now, he had been on our worship team. He'd been our drummer. We have a rock band. He'd been the drummer for the rock band. And when his son was shot and killed, because he's first-generation Christian like all my church, he went into a slide and became an alcoholic. And we had not seen him in church. No matter what we did, we couldn't get him. We couldn't, we couldn't grab him. So I wrote a letter. I invited him to come. I said, I want your daughter to come. I want her to shoot the first basket. I want you to shoot the second basket. I looked up the day of the dedication, and there he was. He came last Sunday, two Sundays in a row. He asked, can I see you? I made an appointment with him Sunday night before I started doing anything to come here. And he said to me, God has been talking to me. Now listen, God has been talking to me for the last three months. And he said, God has shown me I don't have a right to be angry with him. That this over here is where my anger needs to be. And he said, I need to come back to Jesus Christ. And he prayed. He came back to God. I am believing he's going to be in church Sunday morning. But here is my story. If I had stepped over the line and I had gotten the money quicker, the father would not have been ready to come back to God. And we've got to know that when we're in a project, we see this, but Jesus sees it all. He sees the timing. He sees everything. And he knows when that last penny needs to come into that account so everything is in the right space. We can't use emotion, please hear me, to con people out of their finances even if we think the goal is right. And then look what he did. When he had taken the money, he wanted a, grovel, he wanted a molten image. He wanted a God. And he, she then said, well, you know what? I dedicated that money. I dedicated that money to the Lord to make a molten image. Do you see the difference? I gave it to God, but a molten image is just fine. And he made her think that it was her idea to do what he wanted to do. We have tremendous persuasion when we stand behind this sacred desk. People listen to us and they trust us. We cannot manipulate them and get them to think that they're doing something that's their idea when really it was ours in the first place. And we see this man now on a course with his mother. So look now at verse 9. He has seen a Levite. Now, do you see what's happening? The first thing he does is he gets his mother. She makes a molded image. Now, the next man that comes into this story is a Levite. He's a priest. And Micah said to him, from where do you come? And he said to him, I'm a Levite of Bethlehem in Judea, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said to him, dwell with me. Be to me a father and a priest. And I will give you ten pieces of silver each year, a suit of clothes, and your living 
So the Levite went in, and the Levite was content to dwell with the man. And the young man was to Micah as one of his sons, and Micah consecrated the Levite. And the young man became his priest, but his priest to the molten image, not his priest to the living God. So this is what happened. The Levite allowed his integrity to be bought off for money and security. And in this day, there is so much pressure on the pastorate for at times with boards and other situations for us to sell off our integrity for money and security. And one of the things that has to happen is there has to be inside of us that, that strong stand of ethics that says, I can't do it. It's immoral, it's illegal, or it's unethical, or it's unscriptural. And we can't care if they fire us. God's got another church for us. If they dock our pay, God will give it to us another way. When I first went into the ministry, I was in a position where I left a very <clears throat> lucrative position and I went to join a ministry and they paid me $95 every two weeks and one meal a day. And I spent 18 months in that ministry with the head of that ministry in private saying to him, I cannot do that. That is immoral, that is unethical, or that is unscriptural. God wouldn't let him fire me and wouldn't let me quit. So we had one of those wonderful relationships. And I was working on a project for him. I was doing a, I was creating sociograms for him and uh, they, were, they were extremely valuable. And one day he looked at me and he said, if you won't do X, I said, I cannot do X. He said, then I'm going to take this away from you and you're going to clean bathrooms. And I said, then I'm going to clean bathrooms because I can't do that. And I spent four months doing absolutely nothing but cleaning bathrooms. That's all I did. And one day, because he said, you'll never minister for me again and I don't care what you do, I don't care who you are, you will never minister for me again. And at that moment, God said to me, I'll bring it in the window, I'll bring it in the back door, I'll bring it through the wall, you are not reliant on this man. And so I spent four months doing absolutely nothing. And then one day, a knock came on my door. And he was standing in front of my door, and he was red, and he was mad. And he said, there's a family. You were counseling them. They're one of my main contributors. They say that if you don't come back and counsel them, they're going to take away their money. He said, so you've got to go back to work. I said, fine. And he had a campus ministry on the local university, and he was sending different staff members. And the thing was, they couldn't pass their classes. And so he came to me and he said, I can't have a campus ministry if I don't have a student with a B or above average. You've got to go to school. I said, fine. So I went to college, enrolled in a class, took the amount of classes. First semester, I did great. He came to me and he looked at me and he said, all right, you're head of the campus ministry. Because there wasn't anybody else. Do you see what God did? And then an Assembly of God church knocked on his door and said, we want that one to teach our women once a month. Before it was over, I was doing more personal ministry than I was doing before, and there was nothing he could do. But here's the thing. God had put me through a four-month test of cleaning men's bathrooms. And we've got to be willing to say, I'm not for sale. 
The next thing was he allowed his consecration and his ordination to God's service to be compromised for the easy way. We cannot allow people to move us out of what we were ordained to do to do something else even if it looks good. There is a limit to our social consciousness. Do you hear what I'm saying? There's a limit to our political activism. There is a limit to the things we get into. The minute it touches our ordination and our consecration, we have to back away from it because this is who we are more than anything else. And our job is to train other people in our ministries to step into those positions as our hands extended, learning what is our heart because what is the heart of God and they carry those things out and we don't. Because you know what? There's nothing more demanding than certain aspects of social involvement. And we, if we're not careful, we're going to find ourselves saying, I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to read. I don't have time to study because I have to do X, Y, and Z. We cannot allow ourselves to get so busy. It touches our consecration and our ordination. But I want to go back to Micah. Micah said in this last verse, Oh, I know I'm blessed because I have someone more spiritual than I am working for me. Isn't that exactly what he said? God's going to bless me now. It wasn't in his understanding. He wasn't worshiping God. He was worshiping a molten image, and it didn't matter who he had hired. It didn't change the judgment of God. So there are some ethical things that we draw from this verse. And the first one is, do not ever allow Satan to convince you somebody's more spiritual than you are. Because the minute you decide somebody is more spiritual than you are, it's you then put them between you and God. And instead of asking God your questions, you're going to be asking them your questions. And if you find somebody that you think is more spiritual than you are, then that is to promote you to jealousy, to get into his presence, get into the book, find out what he's doing. And listen, you need counselors. You need to bounce things off of your overseer. You need to bounce things off your bishop. But don't put your bishop between you and God. And the next thing that we get out of this is do not allow deception to grab a hold of your mind because as deception grabs a hold of your mind, you don't say deceived in one area. It grows and grows and grows and grows. And by this moment in time, Micah truly thought he was worshiping Jehovah, but he was not. So then where are you worshiping? There is such a fine line. We get so involved in the ministry. We get so involved in the people. It is so easy to let the ministry be the thing we worship, thinking we're worshiping God. And we need to keep our eyes on why do we do this. We do it because of the living God whom we serve. And our goal is to help others come into relationship with him, not make others take his place. And the next thing that we get out of this is years ago, God and I were fussing. He was really silent. I was doing all the talking. And I was explaining to him that it was all his fault. That if he would just kill the false prophets, his church would not be deceived. And I explained to him that because he allowed them to look like they were blessed by him, that people, because I said, you know, human nature, we look like the back end of a 57 Chevy. You know that dog you see in the pictures that's going like this? Well, that's the way that we look. 
We'll believe anything. If you look like you're successful, we got it. You're, we're fine. We'll follow. And I said, it's your fault. You made us. You know that. This is all your fault. And I fussed and fussed and fussed and fussed. And I got pneumonia. And I couldn't do anything but read. And I got to the book of Jeremiah, and I'm reading, and Jeremiah is saying to God, it's your fault. If you would kill the false prophets, the people wouldn't be deceived. I said, look there, we've been telling you this for centuries. I said, look at that. He's been telling, he told you, one of your prophets told you. You've been hearing this for years. And the Holy Spirit said, shut up up and keep reading and I got to the 14th verse and God said to Jeremiah shut up I thought okay we're in good company he didn't like me either and he said I am going to kill the false prophets but I'm going to kill the people too because you cannot be deceived except by your own consent. In an ethical situation, it is so easy to let ourselves get deceived because it's what we want to believe. And we have to learn to say to God every day of our life, I don't give my consent for deception. In verse 17, and I don't have time to do this because I want to get into Samuel, so you're going to have to trust me, but in verses 17 through 20, what happens <clears throat> is some spies come down from the tribe of Dan. They hear this priest's voice. They recognize his voice. They want to know what he's doing there. They ask him to get a word from God. He gives them a word from God, which God I don't know. And then they go on their way. They come back and they say to him, what's better, you to be the priest for a family or you to be the priest for a tribe? And they say to him, let's steal the molten image, the ephod, and everything that Micah has made and we'll take you and you come with us and you be the priest to this tribe. And this is what I got from this. God began to talk to me about it is so imperative how we leave one ministry position and go to another one. We have to ask ourselves a question. Are we moving from one ministry position to the next because God called us or because of our personal ambition? And there is so much ethical problem right now in the ministry because we are all looking for that upward mobile move. We think that the body of Christ is set up like a corporation where it's a, a vertical line. And people that are under people are trying to usurp people to become the senior pastor. It's this kind of constant move. And we don't understand in the body of Christ, we're hitched together like the Amish plow. Have you ever seen the Amish plow? They don't plow with their horses in a, in a vertical line. They plow with their horses in a horizontal line. And the strongest horse is in the center and makes the fewest steps because everything pivots around that center horse. It would not look like that center horse had a promotion at all. We must be careful and say to God, why am I making this move? The next thing is when we leave one locality to go to another locality, we cannot continue to take things out of the past locality. You see, the priest took the molten image and the ephod from his former position and carried it into his next position. 
When you move from one church to the other church, you cannot keep contacts back in the other church and receive money from them on the side. You cannot move to, from one position to the other position and have people from the past position want to tell you you're not going to believe what the pastor is doing here. And you think that you have the right to speak into that church. You can't call those deacons. You can't call those elders and say, that's, you know that's not what we were making this for, blah, 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 blah. You cannot keep contact with your past congregation. And that's a sad thing because you may have made some friends in that congregation, but you can't keep attached to them. Because if they stay in contact with you, they'll never bond with the person God put in that place. The next thing is, do not ever decide, oh, I am working in this church, but I think I'm going to start a church across town. You can't do that. That is totally unethical. And if you are a traveling evangelist, you cannot take money out of the churches that you go to after you're out of there and the offering has been given to you. And if people in that congregation want to send you money, listen to me very carefully, it won't take too long if you take that. And, and I am talking to you because I've got friends in this situation. It won't take too long before the first couple of times they give you money, there's nothing with it. But the third or fourth time, now they're telling you what they want you to correct in their pastor. And you are now obligated because you have taken so much money from them. You cannot do that. And if you are a traveling person and you're on an evangelistic move and you've been in a church and there's been great moves of God and God's done mighty sovereign things in that place, do not let the enemy tell you, okay, well now you're going to come off the evangelistic field and you're going to start a church in this town where you have just had a move of God and you're going to get something that's going to last. And the next thing is, when you are in a church and you are, you are preaching for somebody, whether you're an evangelist or you're a pastor that they have brought in to do something, if somebody walks up and gives you one of those Holy Ghost handshakes, you can't take that money that you don't go to the pastor and say, I just got this put in my hand. May I have it? Or what do you want to do with it? And I have noticed in my congregation, and I've got first-generation Christians, and, and I, there may be some of you in here of this ethnicity, and some of them are Italian, and some of them are Sicilian, and some of them have been family-connected. And we, they've gotten saved, and the hardest thing for me to do is make them understand that we don't do things the way they've always done things. And, you know, we've had some battles in our church because we're the only church our town has. And so several of them have offered, listen, I'll just make a call. And it's like, no, no. We don't do that. But I have noticed that these very same people, before they get delivered, will have a tendency to write a check to the traveling ministry that comes through. And they won't make it out to the church. They'll either put it in, in the offering made out to the person or they will slip it in the person's hand. Because you see, that's the way it was done to get influence. And you have to realize that not always is the money that's given to you dedicated money. Sometimes it's for the wrong motive. 
And the one thing that always works with the devil is when you expose things in the light, he loses his power. And so when you hand that to the pastor and you say, so-and-so gave me this money, what would you like to do? If that person would ever contact you for anything, thinking that that got him influence or her influence, you can honestly say, I showed your check to the pastor. The pastor knows I took it. Or I showed it to the pastor and the pastor has it. You're covered. That cuts anything that somebody wants to say, I own you. And one of the things you have to watch is how did Jesus handle things? Do you remember when Jesus had fed the, the, the multitude? And the, he gets in a, a boat and he, he sends his disciples and then he walks on the water and he gets to the other side. And the people say to him the next morning, we were looking for you. Jesus said, you didn't want me. You wanted what I did for you. And understand something. You come into a church, you minister to a church, somebody gets healed, somebody gets delivered, somebody gets saved. They will form a bond with you not because of what you carried, but what you did for them. And if you don't put them in the right direction, they will make a wrong bond with you and never get the nurture they need at home. When I travel, this is just something I do. If somebody answers the altar call and they want to get saved, I will not pray with them. I will call a pastor from the house. And I will ask the pastor from the house to lead them in that prayer. Reason, I want them right away connected to the house, not connected to me. And you have to realize we are not ever having the right to walk into a situation and form connections with other people's sheep. The next thing that comes from this particular passage of Scripture is you'll see there's this whole conversation that goes on. When you leave one place and you go to the next, do not talk about the previous place to the place you're going. And if you're moving congregations and you're moving from one congregation to the other and you now become a pastor in another congregation, there is a temptation. And this is the temptation. The previous church, after you're away from them a while, they become perfect. No, I'm, I'm not kidding. It's true. You forget all the battles you had. You forget all the nights you prayed all night. You forget all the times that you got in the bathroom, threw your hands in the air and said, God, get me out of here. You forget that. And when you move into all the problems that are in this place, suddenly you start talking about the other place to the new place and making the other place better than the new place. You can't do that. Neither can you go the other way and say things to the new place like, I'm so glad I'm here. You'll never believe what I just left. And you may not think that happens, but I have sat in services and heard that happen one way or another. You can never talk about the place you were just in. When you get into a new place, don't make changes quickly. You have to earn your right to speak. When I came to New York, I had such a thick accent, I didn't understand them and they didn't understand me. And periodically, when I go back home, and I may be home for about 10 days like I was in January, the first thing my church says to me when I get home after about the first sermon I've preached, go spend a day in the Bronx. Just go to the Bronx. For God's sake, go to the Bronx. We don't realize it. But when we come into a place, we bring our worldview into that place. 
But you know what? They may not have that same worldview. And you have to stay quiet. You have to let the Holy Spirit tell you what are their needs. What's going to speak to them? How are they going to respond to you? The first Thanksgiving dinner we had as a church, I made up the menu, you know, and we put it out. And I was so excited with it because it was a menu I would have. And they came to me and they said, Pastor, where are the turnips? I said, the what? They said, where are the turnips? And you know what? Before my brain could be engaged, my mouth spoke. I said, people don't eat turnips. Hogs eat turnips. We eat the greens on the top. We don't eat the turnips. My mouth spoke before my brain was engaged. And they brought out this golden turkey. And everybody looked at me and went, where's the lasagna? You've got to stay really quiet and learn the culture where you are. Because every place has its own culture. Now, when you're there, God's going to tell you how to slowly make changes so that culture is more like a heavenly culture. One of the things that I have worked with our congregation on for months and years, sometimes it seems like we're never going to get it, is that we are not Italian, we are not Jewish, we are not Haitian, we are not Indonesian, we are not Polynesian, and we are not Filipino. We are born-again Christians. But you can't make that major change until you've earned the right to speak. And what, you know what I learned? I learned they don't make sauce. The way. When they said to me, where's the gravy? They didn't mean chicken gravy. They didn't mean beef gravy. They, made, they meant tomato sauce. I didn't know. They said, where's the gravy? I said, it's on the table. They, go, they said, no, it isn't. So this is my next statement to you. Every group of people has their own vocabulary. You've got to stay quiet until you learn their vocabulary. Because you may be preaching one thing and they're hearing something entirely different. We've got to be so careful how we change locations. Next thing is, do not form relationships before you know who's who, who's what, and who needs correction. Because you know, the people that need the most correction are the ones that come up to you first and rub up against you first. Pastor, I know you've been really busy this week. Listen, we're, we're just going to make this dinner and bring it over. Pastor, we got the ladies of the church to do X, Y, Z, P, Q, and F. They ingratiate themselves to you, and most of the time they're the ones you're going to have to deal with. And it's really uncomfortable if you've already become their friend. Be very careful how you make relationships. And when you move into a new locality or even in the locality you're in. Learn who labors among you. Do not make ministerial ties before you know what is that tie going to do for you. And this is what I mean by that. You may make a minister friend that everybody in the community knows is not straight up. And what they're going to say then is you two are just alike because you hang out together. Be very gracious, but always learn who labors among you. And the next thing is never side with abusive people just because they're powerful. You find that in verses 25 and 26. And never form relationships with them because you want to keep your new position or keep the position you're in. 
Now quickly run with me to 1 Samuel. And again, we're not going to have time to read the verses. 1st chapter, we're going to read these first two, verses 15, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sure it's the second chapter, verse 15, and also they burned the fat and the priest's servants came and said to the man who sacrificed, Give the priest meat to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but raw. And if the man said to him, Let them burn the fat first, then you may take as much as you want. The priest's servants would say, No, give it to me now, or I will take it by force. Be very careful who you receive money from in your congregation. Never take money from somebody who wants to exchange money for power. And that's really a key thing. Many pastors have said to me, my greatest blessing and my greatest curse was the same thing. And I would say to them, what's that? And they said, God gave me several millionaires. And they all were after power. But you cannot misuse the things of God. Do not take money because you want it for yourself. Remember, everything that's given is an offering to God. And do not keep demanding more and more and more and more. In verse 22, Verses and 23 through 24, you find that the men were involved in sexual immorality. And I want you to hear me. This is the greatest blotch on the body of Christ right now. And I don't care whether you're a man, I don't care whether you're a woman in ministry, it hits everybody equally. And what happens to you is this. Somebody in the congregation begins to so identify with you because there's so much of the love of God or there's so much that you've done for them, there's so much ministry that you've done for them, they've been moved from this place to this place. The next thing you know, they are looking at you with different eyes. Now, I was fortunate I had been a therapist before I went in the ministry. I'd done counseling for years. And I understood what we called transference. And the problem is the ministry doesn't understand transference. And there is a line when somebody has been helped by you over and over and over, they change the way they look at you. And if you don't catch that subtle change right when it happens, before you know it, it's the very thing that Satan is either using because it now pushes a button in your life or it's an appearance of evil and people stop trusting you. If you have had mistreatment in your childhood, if there has been sexual abuse in your childhood, if there has been any kind of, of severe traumas in your childhood, you are very, very prone to be lured into one of Satan's traps. Get help. Get help. Because I'm telling you, you can check with every restoration team across this country. When they get to the bottom of it, that is the bottom level of everybody that's fallen. If you've got the problem, get help. You have got a compassionate, understanding bishop who will get you help. Don't hold it and wait until there's a crisis to say I'm in trouble. In this day and this age, counseling is the most dangerous thing any of us can do. And you know what? It used to be that you had a, a line and everybody said, well, men with men and women with women, and that's going to take care of the problem. Not anymore. 
There are so many same-sex charges. Don't even think that. You take the same precautions with the same sex as you do with the opposite sex. And you hear me. If you've got couches in your office, get them out. You can, I cannot tell you how many times when everything boiled down to it, and I've worked in situations, and other restoration teams have worked in situations, the problem happened inside the church building, inside the office, because there was a couch in the office. Get them out. If you don't have windows in your doors, get new doors. There has got to be a window. Don't you dare shut a door and you've got somebody you're counseling behind a door without a window. And I don't care what sad story they give you. And honey, they will give you every sad story in the book. Don't walk into a church by yourself any time of the day or night to do a counseling session. Don't you ever do it. You make sure there is somebody right outside your door and you tell them you don't move until that person moves and you make sure that their desk faces your window. And I've got news for you. There are some people I work with that I've got the door open because I know what they're carrying when they walk in the door and it's like, oh, no, you don't. And I got the door open. But you know what? There are some people I won't counsel alone. I will always have my secretary there. Or I'll have another one of my pastors there. And it depends on what I'm seeing, which one of my pastors I bring. And when you are ministering to them, if you minister in deliverance, don't you ever pray alone. I don't care what they tell you. You have somebody with you. First of all, it heightens your discernment, and they'll catch what you don't catch. And second of all, nobody will ever make a charge against you because there's somebody else in that room. And if you are going to deal with sexual sensitive subject matter, make sure there is somebody around you when you do it somewhere in that office area. Because it is getting so. You see, we look at this and we say, how could Eli's sons have sex with somebody in the door of the temple? It's happening every day of America in churches across this land. There has got to be sexual purity in the ministry. If you've got pornography and you're watching it on your computers, listen to me carefully. You can never erase those sites from your hard drive. And if somebody gets your computer, they can get into that hard drive and see every place you've been. I don't care what you do to erase that hard drive that's in there. But I have other news for you. I have an FBI agent that's in and out of my church. When he's in the area, he's in my church. He's in the Pentagon right now. And he told me that the federal government now puts cookies on your computers. And you get on certain sites and they open files on you and the government watches you. Now I'm telling you, if you have a pornography problem, get help. You have an understanding, compassionate bishop. Your bishop is not going to hurt you. Your bishop is going to get you help. But if you've got a pornography problem, you are one step away from the next step, and that's going to take you right down the tubes. And you cannot be involved in self-gratification because that gets you into more trouble. In verse 22 and in verses and chapter 3, verse 13, you realize that this is the next thing of ethics, and we have exactly three minutes to do this. 
when Eli was confronted by the prophet, he did nothing but say to his sons, now listen, guys, you know, I get this evil report and, you know, it's just really not cool what you're doing. As pastors, you have to be gentle as a dove, but listen to me, God is also a God of correction. You cannot turn your head of a sin in your church. And if there is sin in your church and you don't address it, both from the pulpit and in personal situations, it will grow. Because Satan says, oh good, this is a hot box. And when it grows, it absolutely destroys your reputation in the community. And there's a prayer that God gave me years ago. I've prayed it. It always works. And I'm telling you, it always works. And this is it. God expose into the light everything that's being done in the dark. It always works. I have given that advice across this country. Now listen to me. You have got to then be willing to deal with what's exposed. God made a deal with me in the first month of our church. This is what he said. I'll expose it if you'll deal with it, but I'll cover it if you won't. And I said, I will deal with it. And you know what? God has been so faithful to me. I have gotten an urge to go to the grocery store at 1 or 2 in the morning. And I will get this urge not to go to my normal grocery store. God will send me somewhere. And you'll never guess who I see coming out of a bar with who. And they look at me and go, ha, 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 hi, pastor. And I'm going, uh-huh. You're going to see me tomorrow, aren't you? Uh-huh. Don't be shocked at the urges that come to you to go somewhere because God is setting you up to set somebody up. Or somebody is going to come to you and spill the beans. But you have got to be willing to be strong enough to deal with what is exposed. Listen to me, no matter who it's in, it's exposed in. You cannot afford to pet something in one person because of you're afraid of who they are or you're afraid of their personality. And we all have people in our churches whose personality makes our stomach go in a knot. One type of personality or another. And we've got to say it doesn't matter. One of my pastors came to me and said, do you understand that our church would be twice its size if you didn't keep kicking people out? But you know what? I have this thing. If I talk to you once, it's between you and me. If I talk to you twice, it's between you and me. If I talk to you three times, it's between you and me. If I talk to you four times, another pastor's with me. If I talk to you five times, another pastor and a board member's with me. If I talk to you six times, the board and the pastors are with me. If I talk to you seven times, I am blessing another congregation with your presence. <laughs> Our community is very small. Our Christian community on the island is very small. And uh, relatively. And uh, I got a gentleman in a several years ago, and it didn't take too long for a pastor to call me and say, uh, Lynn, listen, um, he uh, gets in there and starts having sex with the women. So I, call, I called him in. I said, your reputation goes before you, brother. I'll offer you deliverance. I'll offer you help. But you will bed, not bed one of my women, and if you do, you are in big trouble. And he looked me over, and he thought, oh, it's a woman. So he targeted one of my board members, seduced her, and got her in bed. Now, she was as guilty as he was. I set her down, took her off the worship team. That was it. It was over. And listen, when I set somebody down, our church knows there's trouble. Do you hear me? I called him in. I didn't wait to deal with him. 
without a pastor. I brought one in and I said, listen to me. Your reputation is you have sampled the waters in every well from Montauk to Queens. You drink one more cup of water in this church and you'll be on your way to another well, brother. Now you either get it right and you get saved and you get converted and you get delivered or you are out of here. Now he thought I was kidding. And he started stalking my elder. She'd come out, there'd be roses under her window. There'd be things on her car. He would be standing outside her front door. I called him in. I said, you are out of here. He thought I was kidding. He showed up on Sunday. My security guy said, Pastor said, you can't come here anymore. I won't put up with it. And it's about time that the church said, wait a minute. We'll help you every way we can help you. But if you are going to sin, you are not going to contaminate this house. When God told Eli through Samuel, this is what I'm going to do, and this is my judgment, Eli said the most horrible thing I've ever heard, and you only see it recorded with one other man, and it was Hezekiah. And this is what Eli said. Let God do what's right in his eyes, and let God do what he's going to do. We can never get to a point where we are beyond repentance ourselves. If Eli would have repented and changed his behavior, who knows what God would have done. Pastors, we are sheep ourselves, and we've got to learn to keep short accounts with God ourselves. Amen. Come on, let's stand up. Give God a praise. Thank you, doctor. That was just... That answered so many questions. Amen. We're ready to go back now with some more understanding. And isn't that what we need as pastors? Come on, just lift your hands up. Father, we just thank you for this wisdom so, so much in season for us. Lord, we were thinking about people, how to deal with things. Thank you for the answers this morning. We go with this new grace, this new wisdom, Lord, so we might be better pastors, effectively sharing the gospel in even hard situations. We thank you and we praise you. Thank you for Dr. Lucas, her testimony and all that she's added to us today. We bless her, strengthen her church, strengthen her pastors, bless her and use her mightily. We thank you now in Jesus' mighty name. Name. Amen. Hallelujah.